I'm here at the Kennedy Space Center Visitor Complex and you can probably see the uh, replica shuttle tanks and solid rocket boosters just over my shoulder. Now I was here to see the launch of Solar Orbiter which is a European Space Agency mission to study the Sun and also to study space weather. This time I've come back to meet Chris Hadfield to talk about the Space Shuttle but I also got a chance to talk to Chris about space weather from an astronaut's perspective. I am here in front of the Atlantis Space Shuttle and I'm joined by Chris Hadfield who is of course our expert. Um, so for people who watch Space Shambles and have watched me doing videos before, um, they'll know that I'm a big fan of the sun. That's my day job is studying the sun and I'm interested in the sun and space weather. And I was looking up for your launches in 1995 when you first flew, that was at solar minimum. Mm -hmm. So the sun was not very active relatively safe time in space, I, as I understand. And then you flew again in um, 2000 and in One. 2001, thank and, you. So that and, was at solar again, maximum. And then again in 12, 13, yeah. So you've flown at different points of the solar cycle. And the flight at, in 2001 happened just after a very large um, energetic particle event that came from the sun. So mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, now I've got you here, yeah. how is space weather factored in? And for that launch in particular, was it delayed? Did it? Did you have to factor it into your launch program? You know, or, or was it just so far down the list of risks that you were like, "Well, well, we live right close in the neighborhood to an enormous continuous thermonuclear explosion, <laughs> right? That's happening. Uh, where we are, you know, we live with a star, and it's only 93 million miles away. And normally, as you say, it's pretty predictable. It goes through those solar cycles, as you know, far better than I do. Sometimes it, it's sort of. Uh, burping a lot of energy our way and sometimes just a nice we can get a, a suntan kind of weather we think about that obviously when we leave the atmosphere because the the air and the water vapor provides a huge amount of protection and the earth's magnetic field takes a lot of that high energy and, and spreads it and gives us the aurora but protects us on the surface when you get on atlantis and get above the atmosphere and above a lot of that magnetic field, you get a lot more direct energy from the sun. So it's one of our concerns. We wear radiation detection monitors. So on your suit, so, so you can well, measure yeah, the particles coming yeah, in. So that we can track over our lifetime how much extra radiation we soaked up as a result of being astronauts. We're also quite cognizant if the sun has an enormous uh, event, some sort of ejection of a great amount of energy, like a coronal mass ejection, like happened back uh, in the eight, mid-1800s with the, the Carrington event. That's right, right? the Carrington event, yeah. the largest um, solar flare in If Magnus one of those gone. happens, then uh, we would be, we might even come home early on the shuttle because that'd be so much known radiation that it would be poisonous to our bodies. And so we have to keep our cumulative radiation below so just sort of a safe lifetime level, just like anybody who works sort of in a, in a hazardous environment. If you work in the nuclear industry or, or, or anything like that in a country, they've got health rules where you're only allowed to soak up so much extra radiation, airline pilots, mm. uh, flight attendants, that type of things. So we track that as well. But you focus very much on the sun, Lucy, and yeah. that's a big thing for you. There are a lot greater risks for an astronaut <laughs> than the radiation coming from the sun. The, the meteorites that can hit us, the structural problems that can happen, the systems failures on the station, on the shuttle, forcing your way through the atmosphere. And then with the stark realization that no matter what goes wrong, no matter what fails, no matter what problems you run into, you still have to fly this thing back down through the atmosphere, somewhere between a meteorite and, a, and, a, and an oak leaf, mm -hmm. and then find a runway and gently land it on a runway. The wheels have to work and, the and it has to all work and touch down and roll to a stop. And the risks that are involved in that huge mixture of demands, uh, definitely the sun and radiation Pushes is one of them, <laughs> but, uh, but it's only one of thousands of risks. And we just look at it, bound it, deal with it, and move on to the next higher risk. One of the other things I like um, about the space weather side is the altitude change that you can have. So of ah. anything that's in orbit or the International Space Station. Um, so when you have these solar activity events, it heats the atmosphere and causes it to expand. So the drag over your spacecraft increases. Sure. And the sort of stat that I always think of is during the 1989 large event that took out some of the electricity distribution in Canada, 
caused the solar maximum mission at, that was in orbit at the time to drop in altitude by about five miles. Yeah. Did you have any cases of that? We think about it all the time. Uh, you know, if you're lying on the beach and the sun is directly on your skin for a while, you can sort of get your hand next to your skin and you can feel that energy from the sun sort of re-radiating off your skin, the heat of it. Well, that happens to the whole world. And when the sun is active, more active than normal, that energy, uh, as it's been uh, uh, hitting the world and then reflected from the world, it actually excites our atmosphere enough that the molecules get a little further apart from each other and the, and the atmosphere gets further from the Earth. Not a lot, but enough that if you were, say, uh, 250 miles up, you would now be hitting more little pieces of the atmosphere than you would have if the sun had been quiet. And so it's almost as if the Earth breathes mm. with the reaction of the sun. And when it breathes, you get more particles out there. And what that means for us is if, if you could somehow stick your hand out the window, you'd have more wind resistance, more drag. And therefore, your orbit, you'd be dragged down to the Earth. Your orbit would decay faster. So when the sun is active, when the sun is busy, then the space station actually has to boost its orbit more often to get away from that drag, to keep uh, from slowing down. It's something like the weight of a penny, that type of drag, that type of, of force slowing the station down at all the time. It's just tiny. Just tiny, but it's enough in, in the emptiness of space to slowly de decelerate you and therefore degrade your orbit. And so um, when the sun is quiet and the atmosphere is small, then we can fly closer to the Earth. But when the sun is busy, the atmosphere gets a little thicker, then we have to think about it. It's also not symmetrical around the world. You know, over the, the North Pole, the atmosphere is a little thinner than it is over the equator. And so if you're coming in to land uh, from the south or from the north, that also changes at what altitude you start to get into the thick atmosphere. And it changes our whole profile for coming home. Mm -hmm. So we're constantly hyper aware of how much air there is around us, how much drag there is around the ship, whether it was caused by the height that we're at or by the energy mm. from the sun. And that's constantly factored into uh, how we navigate and, and how we operate the space shuttle, of course, but, but even the space station. Mm. And there's another Cosmic Shambles video about the thrusters and the, the systems on the, on the shuttle that allow you to make those changes. So yeah. check that one out too. Um, so you were living, you were working on the shuttle. Mm -hmm. When you were out doing the spacewalks, did you see any aurora? I mean, it's a, you know, something for us here on the Earth. We want to look up at what's happening at 100 kilometers above our heads. You were 400 kilometers up looking down. What did you see? Uh, this, we launch out of Florida, which is only about, what, 26 degrees, 28 degrees, I guess, north of the equator. But we also launch out of Kazakhstan, just south of Russia, which is 52 degrees north. And if you launch and you're 52 degrees from the equator, that means you're not going around the world flat. But in fact, your orbital plane is tipped 52 degrees. So the Earth turns underneath you, but you're going as far north as 51.6, 52 degrees, and as far south as 52 degrees. So that means you might see the aurora. You're not gonna see it from Ecuador, no. but you might see it from James Bay or from uh, Scandinavia. And so, 52 degrees north takes you that far away from the equator. And you're in the light half the time. And of course, in the daylight, you can't see it. Your eyes are all shrunk down. But in the night, from on board a spaceship, if you look outside long enough and shut off all the lights in the ship and get your night vision, you can see the aurora any time, basically, that you're in that part of the orbit. There's always some sort of There's always aurora. that ring around the magnetic And, north and the best well. part was when I was out on a spacewalk and uh, we were actually headed south over the Indian Ocean uh, in the dark. And I shut off the lights in my suit so my eyes would get truly night adapted. And as we arc south of Australia and south of, uh, of Hobart and Tasmania there, um, it was an active time. The sun had been uh, cooperatively busy. It had sent a bunch of energy to the Earth. The Earth was collecting it at the south magnetic pole. It was reacting with the upper atmosphere and creating aurora. And we went through it and it was pouring around us. And it's mostly red and green, but there are some other, that, that's the nitrogen and the oxygen up there, but there are other trace gases up there that give sort of delicate shades of other parts of the spectrum as they fluoresce. And so I was outside on a spacewalk with my eyes night adapted, watching us drive into the aurora and having it 
we're going fast enough, you know, 17 and a half thousand miles an hour, <laughs> that then it starts to look like waves and ribbons pouring past us. And Fantastic. and I, I yelled at the guys. I was riding on the end of this big Canada arm at the oh, time. Oh, you were on yeah. the, and the equivalent arm. And I yelled arm. at Jeff and John who were inside saying, guys, shut off the lights, You're, <laughs> we're in the Aurora. And so they shut off all the lights inside and let their eyes adapt and then took a whole bunch of pictures of the Aurora. And then we drove into the sunrise over uh, New Zealand. But for that brief minute, um, this little kid got to surf on the Aurora, one of the most magical experiences of my life. I'm kind of speechless after hearing that, um, but I have to bring myself back to the shuttle. You would have loved it as a solar physicist. I would have I done. Yeah. I've only ever seen the Northern Lights, uh, I've only been in the Northern Hemisphere um, twice, once from Norway, once from Scotland. Ah. And you they, need to come to Canada because the magnetic North Pole is kind of in northern yeah. Canada, so so we're closer to where, where they're, they're most uh, vivid. You Come to Yellowknife or somewhere and ha have a look at the Northern Lights. I'm definitely going to do that. <laughs> or come out on a spacewalk. Oh my goodness, you're getting me excited now. Well, thank you for watching and thank you to NASA and Chris and the Kennedy Space Centre for giving us access to this amazing facility. So like the videos, subscribe to the channel and if you want to find out more about the mathematics of space exploration, you can yep. watch Matt Parker's videos, who's here also. I've got you covered. So I've done some space maths videos. So we'll put a link to those in the description below.